Chapter 4 Igramul the Many Dire hunger and thirst pursued Atreyu. It was two days since he had left the Swamps of Sadness, and since then he had been wandering through an empty, rocky wilderness. What little provisions he had taken with him had sunk beneath the black waters with Artax. In vain, Atreyu dug his fingers into the clefts between stones in the hope of finding some little root, but nothing grew there, not even moss or lichen. At first he was glad to feel solid ground beneath his feet, but little by little it came to him that he was worse off than ever. He was lost. He didn't even know what direction he was going in, for the dusky grayness was the same all around him. A cold wind blew over the needle-like rocks that rose up on all sides, blue and blue. Uphill and downhill he plodded, but all he saw was distant mountains, with still more distant ranges behind them, and so on to the horizon on all sides. And nothing living, not a beetle, not an ant, not even the vultures, which ordinarily follow the weary traveler until he falls by the wayside. Doubt was no longer possible. This was a land of the dead mountains. Few had seen them, and fewer still escaped from them alive, but they figured in the legends of Atreus' people. He remembered an old song. Better the huntsman should perish in the swamps, for in the dead mountains there is a deep, deep chasm, where dwelleth Igramul the Many, the horror of horrors. Even if Atreyu had wanted to turn back and had known what direction to take, it would not have been possible. He had gone too far and could only keep on going. If only he himself had been involved, he might have sat down in a cave and quietly waited for death, as the greenskin hunters did. But he was engaged in the great quest, the life of the childlike empress, and all of Fantastica was at stake. He had no right to give up. And so he kept at it, uphill and down. From time to time he realized that he had long been walking as though in his sleep, that his mind had been in other realms, from which they had returned none too willingly. Bastion gave a start. The clock in the belfry struck one. School was over for the day. He heard the shouts and screams of the children running into the corridors from the classrooms and the clatter of many feet on the stairs. For a while there were isolated shouts from the street, and then the schoolhouse was engulfed in silence. The silence descended on Bastion like a great heavy blanket and threatened to smother him. From then on, he would be all alone in the big schoolhouse. All that day, all that night, there was no knowing how long. This adventure of his was getting serious. The other children were going home for lunch. Bastion was hungry too, and he was cold in spite of the army blankets he was wrapped in. Suddenly he lost heart. His whole plan seemed crazy, senseless. He wanted to go home that very minute. He could just be in time. His father wouldn't have noticed anything yet. Bastion wouldn't even have to tell him he had played hooky. Of course, it would come out sooner or later, but there was time to worry about that. But the stolen book? Yes, he'd have to own up to that too. In the end, his father would resign himself as he did to all the disappointments Bastion had given him. Anyway, there was nothing to be afraid of. Most likely his father wouldn't say anything but just go and see Mr. Coriander and straighten things out. Bastion was about to put the copper-colored book into his satchel, but then he stopped. No, he said aloud in the stillness of the attic. Atreyu wouldn't give up just because things were getting a little rough. What I've started, I must finish. I've gone too far to turn back. Regardless of what may happen, I have to go forward. He felt very lonely, yet there was a kind of pride in his loneliness. He was proud of standing firm in the face of temptation. He was a little like Atreyu after all. A time came when Atreyu really could not go forward. Before him lay the deep chasm. The grandiose horror of the sight cannot be described in words. A yawning cleft, perhaps half a mile wide, twined its way through the land of the dead mountains. How deep it might be, there was no way of knowing. Atreyu lay on a spur at the edge of the chasm and stared down into darkness which seemed to extend to the innermost heart of the earth. He picked up a stone the size of a tennis ball and hurled it as far as he could. The stone fell and fell until it was swallowed up in the darkness. Though Atreyu listened a long while, he heard no sound of impact. There was only one thing Atreyu could do, and he did it. He skirted the deep chasm. Every second he expected to meet the horror of horrors known to him from the old song. He had no idea what sort of creature this might be. All he knew was that its name was Igramul. The deep chasm twisted and turned through the mountain waste, and of course there was no path at its edge. 
Here, too, there were abrupt rises and falls, and sometimes the ground swayed alarmingly under Atreus's feet. Sometimes his path was barred by gigantic rock formations, and he would have to feel his way painfully step by step around them. Or there would be slopes covered with smooth stones that would start rolling toward the chasm as soon as he set foot on them. More than once, he was within a hairbreadth of the edge. If he had known that a pursuer was close behind him and coming closer by the hour, he might have hurried and taken dangerous risks. It was that creature of darkness which had been after him since the start of his journey. Since then, its body had taken on recognizable outlines. It was a pitch-black wolf the size of an ox. Nose to the ground, it trotted along, following Atreus' trail through the stony desert of the dead mountains. Its tongue hung far out of its mouth, and its terrifying fangs were bared. The freshness of the scent told the wolf that its prey was only a few miles ahead. But suspecting nothing of his pursuer, Atreyu picked his way slowly and cautiously. As he was groping through the darkness of a tunnel under a mountain, he suddenly heard a noise that he couldn't identify because it bore no resemblance to any sound he had ever heard. It was a kind of jangling roar. At the same time, Atreyu felt that the whole mountain above him was trembling, and he heard blocks of stone crashing down its outer walls. For a time, he waited to see whether the earthquake, or whatever it might be, would abate. Then, since it did not, he crawled to the end of the tunnel and cautiously stuck his head out. And then he saw an enormous spiderweb was stretched from edge to edge of the deep chasm, and in the sticky threads of the web, which were as thick as ropes, a great white luck dragon was struggling, becoming more and more entangled as he thrashed about with his tail and claws. Luck dragons are among the strangest animals in Fantastica. They bear no resemblance to ordinary dragons, which look like loathsome snakes and live in deep caves, diffusing a nauseous stench and guarding some real or imaginary treasure. Such spawn of chaos are usually wicked or ill-tempered. They have bat-like wings with which they can rise clumsily and noisily into the air, and they spew fire and smoke. Luck dragons are creatures of air, warmth, and pure joy. Despite their great size, they are as light as a summer cloud, and consequently need no wings for flying. They swim in the air of heaven as fish swim in water. Seen from the earth, they look like slow lightning flashes. The most amazing thing about them is their song. Their voice sounds like the golden note of a large bell, and when they speak softly, the bell seems to be ringing in the distance. Anyone who has heard this sound will remember it as long as he lives and tell his grandchildren about it. But the luck dragon Atreyu saw could hardly have been in a mood for singing. His long, graceful body with its pearly pink and white scales hung tangled and twisted in the great spiderweb. His bristling fangs, his thick, luxuriant mane, and the fringes on his tail and limbs were all caught in the sticky ropes. He could hardly move. The eyeballs in his lion-like head glistened ruby red. The splendid beast bled from many wounds, for there was something else, something very big that descended like a dark cloud on the dragon's white body. It rose and fell, rose and fell, all the while changing its shape. Sometimes it resembled a gigantic long-legged spider, with many fiery eyes and a fat body encased in shaggy black hair. Then it became a great hand with long claws that tried to crush the luck dragon, and in the next moment it changed to a giant scorpion, piercing its unfortunate victim with its venomous sting. The battle between the two giants was fearsome. The luck dragon was still defending himself, spewing blue fire that singed the cloud monster's bristles. Smoke came whirling through the crevices in the rock, so foul-smelling that Atreyu could hardly breathe. Once, the luck dragon managed to bite off one of the monster's long legs, but instead of falling into the chasm, the severed leg hovered for a time in midair, then returned to its old place in the black cloud body. And several times, the dragon seemed to seize one of the monster's limbs between its teeth, but bit into the void. Only then did Atreyu notice that the monster was not a single, solid body but was made up of innumerable small steel-blue insects, which buzzed like angry hornets. It was their compact swarm that kept taking different shapes. This was Igramul, and now Atreyu knew why she was called the Many. He sprang from his hiding place, reached for the gem, and shouted at the top of his lungs, Stop! In the name of the childlike Empress, stop! But the hissing and roaring of the combatants drowned out his voice. He himself could barely hear it. Without stopping to think, he set foot on the sticky ropes of the web, which swayed beneath him as he ran. He lost his balance, fell, clung by his hands to keep from falling into the dark chasm, pulled himself up again, caught himself in the ropes, fought free, and hurried on. 
At last, Igrimor sensed that something was coming toward her. With the speed of lightning, she turned about, confronting Atreyu with an enormous steel-blue face. Her single eye had a vertical pupil, which stared at Atreyu with inconceivable malignancy. A cry of fear escaped Bastion. A cry of terror passed through the ravine and echoed from side to side. Igrimul turned her eye to left and right to see if someone else had arrived, for that sound could not have been made by the boy who stood there as though paralyzed with horror. Could she have heard my cry? Bastion wondered in alarm. But that's not possible. And then Atreyu heard Igrimul's voice. It was very high and slightly hoarse, not at all the right kind of voice for that enormous face. Her lips did not move as she spoke. It was the buzzing of a great swarm of hornets that shaped itself into words. Ah, two legs, Atreyu heard. Years upon years of hunger, and now two tasty morsels at once. A lucky day for Igramul. Atreyu needed all his strength to keep his composure. He held the gem up to the monster's one eye and asked, do you know this emblem? Come closer, true legs, buzzed the many voices. Igramul doesn't see well. Atreyu took one step closer to the face. The mouth opened, showing innumerable glittering feelers, hooks, and claws in place of a tongue. Still closer, the swarm buzzed. He took one more step, which brought him near enough to distinguish the innumerable steel-blue insects which whirled around in seeming confusion, yet the face as a whole remained motionless. "'I am Atreyu,' he said. "'I have come on a mission from the childlike Empress.' Mm, "'Most inopportune,' said the angry buzzing after a time. "'What do you want of Igramul? As you can can see, see, she is is very busy.' I want this luck dragon, said Atreyu. Let me have him. What do you want him for? Atreyu, two legs? I lost my horse in the swamps of sadness. I must go to the southern oracle, because only Uyalala can tell me who can find the childlike empress a new name. If she doesn't get one, she will die and all Fantastica with her. You too, Igramu. Ah, the face drawled. Is that that the reason reason for all the places places where there is nothing? Yes, said Atreyu. So you too know of them. But the Southern Oracle is too long a journey for a lifetime. That's why I'm asking you for this luck dragon. If he carries me through the air, I may get there before it's too late. Out of the whirling swarm that made up the face came a sound suggesting the giggling of many voices. (laughs) You're all wrong, Atreyu Two Legs. We We know know nothing nothing of the the Southern Southern Oracle and nothing of Uyalala, but we do know know that this dragon cannot carry you. And even even if you were were in the best of health, health, the trip would take so long that that the childlike empress would die of her illness in the meantime. You You must must measure measure your quest to trail in in terms terms not not of your own life, life, but of hers. The gaze of the eye with the vertical pupil was almost unbearable. That's true, he said in a small voice. Besides, the motionless face went on, the luck luck dragon dragon has has Igramul's poison in his body. body. He He has has less less than than an hour hour to live. live. Then there's no hope, Atreyu murmured. Not for him, not for me, and not for you either, Igramul. Oh well, the voice buzzed. Igramul would at least have had one good meal. But who says it's Igramul's last meal? She knows a way of getting you to the Southern Oracle in a twinkling. But the question is, will you like it? What is this way? That is Igramul's secret. The creatures of darkness have their secrets too, Atreyu Two Legs. Igramul has never revealed hers. And And you you too too must swear swear you'll never tell a soul. For it it would would be greatly to Igramul's disadvantage if it were known. Yes, Yes, greatly to to her disadvantage. I swear, speak. The great steel blue face leaned forward just a little and buzzed almost inaudibly. You must let Igramul 
bite, bite you. you. Atreyu shrank back in horror. Ingramul's poison, the voice went on, kills within an hour. But to one who has it inside him, it gives the power to wish himself in any part of Fantastica he chooses. Imagine if that were known. All Ingramul's victims would escape her. An hour? cried Atreyu. What can I do in an hour? Well, buzzed the swarm, at least it's more than all the hours remaining to you here. Atreus struggled with himself. Will you set the luck dragon free if I ask it in the name of the childlike empress? He finally asked. No, said the face. You, you have, have no right to ask that of Igramul, even if you are wearing Orin the gem. The childlike empress takes us all as we are. That's why Igramul respects her emblem. Atreyu was still standing with bowed head. Igramul had spoken the truth. He couldn't save the White Luck Dragon. His own wishes didn't count. He looked up and said, Do what you suggested. Instantly the steel blue cloud descended on him and enveloped him on all sides. He felt a numbing pain in the left shoulder. His last thought was, To the Southern Oracle. Then the world went black before his eyes. When the wolf reached the spot a short time later, he saw the giant spiderweb, but there was no one in sight. There, the trail he had been following broke off, and try as he might, he could not find it again. Bastion stopped reading. He felt miserable, as though he himself had Igramul's poison inside him. Thank God I'm not in Fantastica, he muttered. Luckily, such monsters don't exist in reality. Anyway, it's only a story. Was it only a story? How did it happen that Igramul, and probably Atreyu as well, had heard Bastion's cry of terror? Little by little, this book was beginning to give him a spooky feeling. 